The purpose of this video is for us to take basic concepts of genetics and apply them to an organism that's easily raised in a laboratory setting. The Drosophiles melanogaster is such an organism. Now this is a fruit fly that's about three millimeters in size, typically found around rotting fruit. This fruit fly will allow the student to gain connections between populations, organisms, the cell, chromosomes, the gene, and DNA. Additionally, when we look at the Drosophiles, it is typically used as an example organism because it is a small animal. It has a short life cycle of about two weeks. It's cheap. It's easy to keep in large numbers. And when we look at the mutation of the flies, there are defects on, on several thousand genes available. And these defects are easily identified. Additionally, sexing the uh, fruit fly into male and female is simple. And the entire genome of the fruit fly has been identified. So we will be reviewing over the basic information associated with Drosophiles melanogaster, or the fruit fly. The Drosophiles fruit fly, also known as the red-eyed palmas fly, is classified in the family Drosophilidae in order Diptera. It has four pairs of chromosomes and a short life cycle. Uh, just some background information, the Drosophiles was first recorded in New York City in 1875 and then again in New Haven in 1879. Now like all insects, the Drosophiles have three main body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The major structures on the head, we will see these red eyes. Now this is very characteristic of wild type or non-mutations of the eyes. The thorax has the six pairs of legs, and it has two pairs of wings. We will be using some of the legs to help with identification between male and female. The average lifespan of the Drosophiles depends on the environmental conditions. Typically, these are going to be 80 to 153 days, but the average life cycle of a lab fly is going to be about 26 days for a female and about 33 days for a male. Uh, as in that life cycle, the Drosophiles will go through four stages, and those four stages take about 10 to 14 days to complete. The courtship begins by the male tapping the abdomen of the female with his foreleg, and this is meant as a way to identify his own species. He approaches the female fly from the front and circles around her, making about a half turn. He'll stick a wing out, vibrating it for several seconds, and if the female is receptive, copulation will result. The sperm from the male are deposited in the female's uterus, and they're held there in the seminal receptacle, and they may be... Um, more than one mating and so the female can hold sperm from more than one male fly. The eggs are about five millimeters long and the fertilized eggs are laid generally around the third day of the female adult's life. Uh, when we look at the female's uh, life cycle, within uh, the first eight to ten hours after she is hatched, she is sexually mature. For purposes of lab uh, set up, we must isolate the females early on before they become sexually mature in order to set up proper uh, laboratory protocol. The Drosophiles egg is about half a millimeter long and it takes about one day after fertilization for the embryo to develop and hatch into a worm-like larvae. The larvae stage consists of the maggots which crawl through the food, eating as they go. Now this stage lasts about seven days, and during this time, the larvae eat and grow, continuously molting. Uh, they'll molt one day, then two day, and then four days after hatching. And after this, they will move to their third installed larvae, and it molts one more time to form an immobile pupa. Now in this pupa phase, th these are the cocoons in which the larvae change into the adults. This stage can last up to five days, and it's during this time that the larvae remodel itself where wings are formed, and then the pupa will hatch into a uh, 
immature fly. And as the pupae begin to prepare to hatch, the eyes and the dark wings can be seen forming on the inside. And one can tell if a pupa is about to hatch by looking at the color of the pupa. And if they are dark, they are close to hatching. Now once the adults emerge from the pupa, they will be elongated and the wings may still be folded up for about an hour. Um, after that time, the wings will uh, be able to expand and, and the flies will be able to fly. Uh, it is during this time that we want to separate the males from the females because after eight hours, uh, eight to ten hours, the adults are sexually mature and to have a proper lab set up in which valid results can be estimated and, and um, analyzed, we must start with the virgin female flies. Now the fruit flies uh, need to be incubated at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Once the flies have emerged from the pupa, we can then separate and uh, sex and separate the flies. We must first knock the flies out. Now in order to work with the flies, I have a picture of the various material that we use. Now these are our camel hair brushes. Uh, when we uh, anesthetize our flies, we need to move the flies around without damaging them. And so we use our camel hair brushes to move the flies around. Uh, I use uh, fly nap as my anesthesis. Uh, this works very well as far as knocking the flies out without um, killing the flies. Uh, this is the setup I typically use. Now, this is what uh, the flies would come in when they're shipped to you. And what we do is we have to take the flies that have emerged from here and move them to an empty uh, container. Once we have done that and we have stoppered the uh, container, we will take some of our fly nap, we will put it on a little wand, and we will set the wand inside of the container. The flies will be knocked out within a moment, and then we can start to sex the flies. There are uh, many different ways that one can um, sex the flies. They can look at the abdomens, uh, the width of the abdomens, they can look at stripes. However, the easiest and most accurate way to sex the flies is to look on their front legs. And when you look on the front legs, using a um, dissecting microscope, you will see these structures right here. Now these right here are called sex combs and they are only present on the male fly. And so while newly emerged flies may be difficult to sex, going by the sex combs you will never make a mistake. Now here we have a female fly. This is a wild type. We can see the red eyes. We can see the wings clearly made. But we're going to look right here on these front legs. Now I tell my students to think of the sex combs as like uh, elbow pads. And so when we look in this elbow area, we do not see any sex combs. So that would be indicative of a female fly. Here we have the male fly. And again, if we will look in that elbow area on those front legs, we will see the um, sex combs, and that's indicative of a male fly. And you will need to use this to separate the flies into the males versus the females. Drosophiles flies have four pairs of chromosomes. Chromosome 1 are the sex chromosomes, or the XY chromosomes. And so when one sets up a sex-linked type cross between uh, fruit flies, they will use chromosome 1 characteristics such as bar-eyed. Chromosomes 2, 3, and 4 are the autosomes. Now chromosome 4 is quite small and it's rarely heard of. So when one sets up a monohybrid cross or a dihybrid cross with their fruit fly, they typically are using traits found on chromosome 2 or 3. The size of the genome is about 165 million bases and contains about 14,000 genes. If we compare this to the human genome, the human genome has about 3 billion bases and um, 22,500 genes. The genome uh, has, been, has been sequenced and um, 
one of the characteristics that we can look at with the genome is how it has been sequenced. Now when we talk about the chromosomes of the fruit fly, they have polyteen chromosomes. Now these are going to be magic markers that put Drosophiles in the spotlight. And so as the fly larvae grow, it keeps the same number of cells, but it needs to make more and more genes. And so as the cells get bigger, they make the chromosomes, and the chromosomes divide hundreds of times, but all the strands will stay attached to one another. Now even better, the chromosomes begin to form uh, dark patterns and light bands. It's like a barcode. And this is unique for each section of the chromosome. And so we can read these bands to identify what part of the chromosome we're looking at. And we can look and determine if uh, there are deletions or rearrangements on the chromosome. And we can use that to identify abnormalities. So the standard mapping of a polyteen chromosome is to divide the genome into 102 numbered bands. Bands 1 through 20 would be found on the X chromosome, 21 through 60 on the second, 61 through uh, 100 would be on the third chromosome, and 101 through 102 on the fourth chromosome. And then each of these is divided into six lettered bands, um, the letters going from A to F. And then those lettered bands are subdivided into up to 13 numbered divisions. And so we can use the location of genes and we can look up and find a specific condition or trait. And then by counting these bands, we can put an identification code onto where that trait is found and on what chromosome. Now I added this chart to show you some of the various traits that are found on the Drosophilus fly the chromosome number that they are associated with, and whether that trait is dominant or recessive. Now this will be key when you're doing your uh, theoretical calculations in order to uh, predict what should occur before the flies mutate. And then once the flies have, um, you set up your crosses and you've crossed your flies, then when you do your actual counts, you can compare that to your theoretical numbers to determine whether or not the uh, mating occurred properly or if there was any type of contamination or crossing over that occurred. On this page I showed you some of the various phenotypes of um, flies that can occur. The wild type is the normal non-mutated fly and we will typically start off with a cross of a wild type fly with some mutation. Um, on this page, I have used the curly fly uh, mated with the wild type, and I've also used the white eyes mated with the wild type. Do you remember that phenotype is the appearance of the flies? And so here we have some uh, various phenotype examples. Wild type with no mutations. Here we have ebony body, vestigial or crinkled up wings. We have our curled up wings. And so these are examples of phenotypes or visible mutations uh, that you can observe. Here we are showing a typical cross between two flies. Uh, on this we have the VG plus showing vestigial wings. Uh, this would be wild type. This would be carrying the vestigial uh, gene. And so we would have a, a heterozygous normal fly for wings here. And here we have the uh, BL plus showing wild type for color. And the BL here for carrying for ebony or, or black uh, body. And so we have a heterozygous normal fly that we are crossing with a, right here we have vestigial or crinkled wings, and we have our black uh, or ebony body. When one uh, sets up a cross between a wild type fly and a mutation, they do want to do a theoretical calculation to determine what is expected 
with the F1 and the F2 generations. The F1 generation being the first generation. Uh, this would be the children of the flies that are crossed. And then we would take some of those children and cross them again. And we would look at those, which are the F2, which would be the grandchildren of the original flies that are crossed. And then by doing that theoretical calculation and doing an actual count, we can determine uh, if our expected ratio held up or did we have any crossing over or any, um, any kind of contamination that's occurring. So I have uh, two Punic squares set up showing uh, how to do a theoretical calculation between a, a curly mutant gene and a wild type. And here I've got my wild type and here I have my curly. Uh, one of the things that I tell my students is to make sure that your lowercase looks very different from your uppercase. So I have an uppercase W, lowercase, this being heterozygous wild type heterozygous wild type, heterozygous wild type, heterozygous wild type. So in this cross right here, if I was to cross wild type flies with um, curly flies, I would expect all of my F1 offspring to be heterozygous wild type. Here we have the same type of situation crossing wild type with wide eyed. And so we would indicate our male and our males here are going to be um, wide-eyed. Now this is for a sex-linked trait. Here we have our um, cross where we have our wide-eyed um, and our, our um, men right here and our wild type here. So this is a wild type uh, female. We cross it and we would look at our results. We would expect our female to be 50% white and 50% red and our males 50% white, 50% red. Again, um, just uh, another example for you to practice and go through uh, just to understand the setup of the Punit square. Showing again, if we were to start off with red-eyed females and white-eyed males, cross them, we would expect all of our F1 to be red. If we were to cross our F1, we would expect our F2 to have a 3 to 1 ratio. Now with this, our female would all be red. Our males, we would have half red and half white. This right here would be due to the fact that our white is a sex-linked trait. Here we would start off with white-eyed females and red-eyed males. Here all of the females would be red-eyed. The males would all be white-eyed. If we come down and we were to cross those, we would end up with half of our females red-eyed and half of our um, males red-eyed. And again, what we're looking at is the difference on our sex-linked traits. And here we have an example Punit square of a uh, dihybrid cross. If you have forgotten how to do dihybrid crosses, do go back and look at my um, genetics video on uh, how to do dihybrid crosses and I will explain step by step how we came up with this calculation. Now this page shows um, after we have done the experiment and we have counted a hundred flies and we recorded our results and we count how many wild type flies we had. We had 40 male wild type flies and we had 30 female wild type flies for a total of 70 wild type. We had, and we'll use this as apterus, we had uh, 15 apterus or mutated uh, flies that were male, and we had 15 uh, mutated flies that were female for a total of 30. If we started off with our parents being this right here, which was a wild type carrier crossed with a wild type carrier and we were to do our punit square what we're going to see is we would have three wild to one mutant now we're going to see if this holds up. So we are going to take uh, our information that we have right here 
and so we have 70 out of 100. So if I take our 30 and divide 30 by 30, that's 1. And if I take this right here and I divide 70 by 30, that's going to be 2 point, uh, let's see, 30, 2 2.3, 2.4, roughly there. So we have a 1 to 2.5. This right here is very close to this right here. So it looks like our traits hold up. And so that's the reason that you will need to do your theoretical calculations in advance so that you will have this bottom information down here that you can compare with your actual to determine did our cross hold up or was there some type of um, abnormality going on? Did we have crossing over? Did we have some kind of contamination? Uh, and in, in the actual field, are we finding some kind of, of new connection within genetics?